This is Power Trading Radio. Live. Power Trading Radio. Live. Fueled by Online Trading Academy. For more information on the show, visit us online at powertradingradio.com. Now, here's your host, Merlin Rothfeld. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Weekend Edition. My name is Merlin Rothfeld. It is the weekend is upon us. Pretty excited. The weekend before Thanksgiving, we've got the Ambassador of Opportunity here in studio with us. John, welcome back. Thank you, Merlin. Great to be here. No guest today. No guest. I am your guest today. You are the guest, right? All right. Am cool. I the guest or am I the co-host today? What are we going to do? You're a co-host. You're a weekend. You're one always the co-host on Fridays. One day, I need to show up and I need to interview you. Now that would be, we could be a flip flop and rolls, Merlin. Okay. What do you think? What are you doing next you, week? You think you think you could wing it, or do you, we need to script that out a little bit? What yeah, do you I think? I don't know, man. I'm a little bit. I don't really do well on the fly. Maybe we can we have them bring the teleprompter over here, and I could just really make sure because I don't want to make sure I don't say anything out of line. I've always thought you of you as Merlin McFly. You know, <laughs> it's always always I thought you. So what are you doing next week, John? I'm ready. Uh, I have no guests all next week. For Thanksgiving? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're not even sure if we're doing shows, but it might be kind of fun. Really? Do you guys want to see do, uh, do a show next week? I'm sure the viewers would love to see a show out there. Well, we can always, we can always uh, wing it. We, no, we've never done that before. Hello, Ruben. Hello, Patrick. Hello, others out there on our YouTube channels. Uh, we'll start off with some of the bigger headlines of the week. Of course, we'll guide it down a path of what you guys want us to go into. Generally, on a Friday show, for those of you who might not know, we kind of keep it higher level topics. We'll probably analyze some macroeconomic charts here and and take it from there. Uh, Tom sent this one to Online Trading Academy's Twitter page, and I thought, all right, well, let's just tackle it today. So sorry, Joanne. I know that Joanne is saying, well, they'll get to it next week. Why wait till next week? It's pretty appropriate to do it right now. And that's going to be going over the issues uh, and, I guess, news from Charles Schwab. Of course, we talked uh, a couple months ago about how Charles Schwab and others are all of a sudden going to zero commissions, and that would really change the landscape of the trading universe, which I believe it has. Now all of a sudden we're seeing a potential shakeup yet again with regards to that trading universe that coming in the form of Charles Schwab uh, intending to buy Ameritrade, which is convenient because we actually said that on the show, said now Ameritrade becomes a very attractive target, as does E-Trade, and Ameritrade maybe get a, uh, merged with Schwab here or get bought by Schwab, and then we also have rumors of Goldman Sachs potentially buying E-Trade or having an interest in E-Trade. So John, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the maybe the mar macro market impacts of those two potential transactions. Well, remember who both these clients serve, Th both of these large intermediaries. And they're large. Uh, you're talking about collectively, if, if they were to come together in a merger agreement, 22 million accounts, $5 trillion of assets under management. That's huge. But it's all retail. However, if we're, so I don't think, you know, if we believe that the retail activity pattern is basically, uh, if you aggregate all the retail order flow, I don't think it's going to have that much of an impact on the market. Uh, I don't. I don't believe so. I believe it will have perhaps an impact on the perception of the market. But remember, institutions, through their sheer size, and generally this order flow, gets sold uh, through the concept of sale of order flow phenomenon to an institution, who basically aggregate all of this. So really, what the Schwab and E Trade model has been for a decade now is to be the aggregator of retail order flow, consolidate m multiple small broker dealers. Over the last 20 years, um, I believe Ameritrade alone has rolled up about 20 different mom and pop broker dealer arrangements. So mm -hmm. um, who was that big group out of St. Louis they purchased? Uh, that, they Sean Kim so used, that Sean, Sean Kim used to work for. Scott Trade? Scott Trade. Yeah. Uh, Ameritrade rolled them up uh, just about a year ago. So. Uh, I don't think it's going to have a big impact on the market. Um, I think it's going to have a big impact on the competition in the industry to make money on from other things than transaction fees of stocks. You know, the stock transaction fees have been going down for some time. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, clearing has been going away from uh, not only the price of the transaction, but also the spreads have narrowed. The markets have become more efficient. Transaction costs have dramatically dropped. Uh, selling has gone 
away from the exchanges. There, there isn't much that's cleared on the New York Stock Exchange anymore. Matter of fact, the New York Stock Exchange got purchased by ICE. Mm -hmm. So the consolidation is, uh, has been going on for two decades, people. <laughs> this is not new. It's Mer not going to change either. No, and it's, it's not going to finish until it's finished. Uh, but let me tell you what is impactful. Uh, I believe, which could be that Goldman Sachs is going to acquire E-Trade, and now we're going to have a, a unit of Goldman Sachs, which will be a small amount of their capital, serving the retail clients. Goldman Sachs historically is not right. served in the retail space. Now that's going to be kind of interesting, because why would Goldman Sachs, because I think Goldman Sachs, they they've bought a bank, they're trying to get in retail finance space, they bought a crypto exchange. They bought are, are going to launch a crypto exchange, and now they're going to own a retail unit for equity trading, mm -hmm. futures trading, options trading. That's basically what E Trade does. So this is going to get kind of interesting. Of course, E Trade also owns a bank, so that they could unbolt those two applications and uh, work very well for Goldman Sachs. So I think. This is time to get bullish on the acquisition of E-Trade. I think they're next in line. You know, for me, for those that have been uh, sending questions about, you know, who's going to be the big winner here? Is it going to be Ameritrade? Is it going to be E-Trade? Is it going to be Goldman? Is it going to be Schwab? When we talked about the, uh, the war going on with regards to commissions and fees a couple months ago, what was glaringly obvious to me was Charles Schwab's position, which was they're not, it, the, the, the lack of charging commissions didn't impact them very much. It was a very small percentage of their revenue came from commissions, so it was no big deal. Ameritrade, it was a huge portion of their, or not a huge, a much larger slice of the pie came yeah. from commissions from their clients. So when I looked at Schwab and realized where they were making most of their money off the retail orders, it was off of, I'll call it interest arbitrage. They pay their customers yeah. almost zero, yet they use the capital that's sitting in their accounts and get interest on that to the tune of maybe 2%, 3%, who knows what they're getting for, maybe in loaning that higher than that, and that difference they're keeping and that's where they're making the money. So from a pure business perspective, I think that this is fantastic for Schwab because now they have so many more clients that they can do that same process on, which is going to be use their money that's probably sitting there idly. Most retail investors are just going to kind of sit there and not do too much. Use that capital, gain a lot more interest, and get a greater rate of return. Now the question, John. Oh, by, by the way, yeah. plus they've taken out a competitor. Right. Right? I mean, that that is, you know, when you're number one and number two in the market, pretty much one and two in the market, you got to throw Fidelity in there somewhere. Let's not... Hold on, I got to... Fidelity's coming up. I want right. to finish the discussion. You got to throw so, them in there somewhere. All right. Look at the price chart here, though, guys. TJ, bring this one up. Uh, this is Charles Schwab's price chart going back into October. And if you look at down below here, in October, they were down around the $35 mark. And they just recently, as of yesterday, I know some of you really crushed it on this one yesterday, so congrats to those who did. They hit uh, $44. So you're looking at a, a $10 swing. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not uh, $44. Uh, that's going to be a higher number. Go over one more, TJ. There we go. How about, uh, I'll call it 51 That's a little better. That's a huge swing in a period of about a month and a half, almost two months. You know, it begs the question, is it going to make that big of a difference? And I don't think, I think that this is actually a, uh, an overbought situation where people had a knee-jerk reaction that thought this was going to be great. Because remember, normally when a company acquires another, the company that is being acquired shoots up and the company that's doing the acquiring declines in value. So I, I personally and, and think you'll see this close that gap. I think you'll see it back at 44 here over the next couple weeks, maybe a month, simply to close that gap. But in the long run, I do think Schwab is in a great place because the acquisition allows them to capitalize more on the interest they're charging their customers. Yeah. Pull up Ameritrade's AMTD yep. and look at that same chart. TJ, if you wouldn't mind, bring up Ameritrade. All right, here's Ameritrade. Look Big, at that. Oof, yeah. I mean, it's funny, look at the initial day on October, right? Was that the last day of September, and, and, early October? And that thing was in a bear market. Yeah. You know, and um, so, but remember, it's probably going to be a stock for stock deal. It's not, there's not going to be a lot of cash involved in this deal. So they're basically going to amalgamate balance sheets. Here's what I, you know, what are they going to keep? What components? There's like um, 19,000 employees at Schwab, and I think it's about 11,000 employees at Ameritrade. What percent of that staff's going to get cut? Do you think, Merlin? I right. mean, there's, you're, a you're, significant amount. You're going to, you're going to, because you've got overlapping responsibilities, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And uh, a lot of overlapping responsibilities. Plus, more and more of these transactions 
are self-directed, right? Yeah. I mean, both of them have, this is by far the most active self-directed clientele base on this planet, mm. you know? But even among 22 million accounts in That's aggregate, crazy. what percent of them are, are really doing, you know, what? Five or ten transactions a but, week, but it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's the assets under management, A U M, that really matters That's correct. to Schwab here. And as you said, net interest income. Right. That's what really matters. So let, let's take a step deeper, but, a deeper dive into this war. Let's, one last thing. Sure. These two together serve as custodian of the assets for the vast majority of registered investment advisors, and that is a huge category. Because that's not active money. That's passive right. investing money uh, that's fee, that produces fee income off all the products that Schwab. You know, Schwab has their own branded mutual funds uh, and, and uh, ETFs. So consequently, there's no reason in the world. I mean, that is a, that may cause the FTC to take a hard look of concentration of power right. in that one category. And they, that may have to get spun off or you know, and that business could get diluted. The next candidate to handle that business is Fidelity. Fidelity has a huge mm -hmm. um, uh, system that acts as custodian for registered investment advisor category. You know, there's one other piece. I'm actually trying to pull up some uh, some data here. So sorry if I keep staring off to the side. Um, the, in an interesting twist, okay, so this, this war between brokerage firms has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Of course, we've seen some uh, victors out of it, certainly Ameritrade and Schwab. I, I haven't looked at the chart of E-Trade today, but I think E-Trade was suffering a little bit. ETFC, there you go. Uh, bring that one up, ETFC. So, boy, I tell you what, after they made that announcement of no commissions, they rallied pretty good, too. I mean, they were down sub-36 to rallying up to almost 46, so that's a $10 move just... Uh, well, uh, great opportunity there. Anyway. Well, uh, that, that's in speculation that they're going to have to get be bought up. Right, right. So okay. we have the, everybody going to zero commissions. Okay, that kind of uh, rippled through to a lot of other parties out there. Actually, I think, I think it got a little bit bigger than I thought. Even some direct access firms are now going to zero commissions. So that said, I made the point that I think Schwab is the victor here because they are now getting millions of new accounts that it just has dormant money. They can now claim more interest income off of that. Fidelity, I saw yesterday during the football game, Fidelity was running an ad saying, hey, look, we'll pay you in a money market fund, what, I don't know, it was 1%, 1.5% interest or something, and then they lined up all the other brokerage firms and they said zero, 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 zero. And it was kind of funny because right. now all of a sudden this war went from commissions and Fidelity knows darn well that that's why Schwab is doing so well. So this could also be a, a, a potential problem for, or maybe not a problem, but a a new uh, battleground for the brokerage firms. Yeah, and by the way, al along that meme you just discussed, IBD has an ad out uh, all the time on CNBC talking about what margin interest rates are and the big differential in margin interest rates. And, and you know, it's like uh, 200, 300 basis points in difference mm -hmm. for a margin uh, uh, position. John, explain that for viewers because some people might not understand. It, this is one of those concepts that when you fill out your brokerage application and whatever brokerage firm you're using anywhere in the world, if it's a margin account, you're signing something and let's be honest, none of you, well, I don't want to sound too arrogant, most of you, the vast majority, I'll say 99% of you, did not read through every page of your contract when you opened your Ameritrade or your Schwab or your Fidelity accounts. You just said, uh, click, click, accept, 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 and moved on. You're accepting their margin practices. So talk to us about margin and why it's important, the margin well, practices. Well, the, the margin is the demand for money. And, and generally speaking, the Federal Reserve System has, you know, Reg T that sets the margin level, but the rate at which you charge interest when you borrow money with a brokerage firm is set internally by their internal supply and demand for money. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you go to Ameritrade or you go to Schwab or you go to IBD or you go to uh, others uh, or Fidelity, you're going to find that that rate can be negotiable depending upon the size of your dormant funds. But basically what those brokers are doing are taking your dominant, uh, dormant cash in your account and they're lending it out to somebody that wants to 
use that capital, and as Merlin said earlier in this conversation, they're taking the net interest differential. But that rate of interest is different per broker. There is no regulation on what that rate of interest will be. That's set by supply and demand internally with what the market will bear with that broker-dealer. So if you're really an active trader, you could probably go in, and you're doing a lot of transactions, you could go in there and do some negotiation with your broker and get a better rate. Also, margin applies to your borrowed money. So let's say, for example, uh, you've got two to one margin. You get a $10,000 Schwab account and intraday you can have, let's say, two to one. You can even have two to one overnight. So you have $10,000, but you have a $20,000 position, meaning you're now two to one. You're paying margin and that rate that that firm is charging you could be very different at every location, right? You would think, oh, it's yeah. going to be 4% for me to no. borrow that money. It could be 4, could be 5, 6, 8, 10. Depends on the brokerage firm. I don't know. I'm sure there's a cap at some point. Uh, and they're all relatively low, but I have seen big discrepancies behind that. So keep that in mind if you're using a margin account uh, and depending on how they set up that margin account, you could be paying that interest on a daily uh, on a yeah. daily basis and it starts to add up very quickly. And part of the, <clears throat> the fundamentals on what determines that rate is the amount of cash balances that are available to the broker dealers, right? Yep. I mean, not every broker dealer has this, the same amount of capital available at any given moment in time. I mean, if you're Morgan Stanley or you're Goldman Sachs and you're, you, you're, you're giving margin to big hedge funds, that's a very, very low rate. But if, you know, if you want margin on a thousand shares of Microsoft at Fidelity, it's going to be a much higher rate. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's wrap up that discussion. Anyway, Thomas, that was our, our take on. It. I think um, barring a war with regards to how much the, they're going to pay you to keep your money at a specific brokerage firm, I think Schwab stands to win out dramatically. I would wait for a pullback. Uh, certainly closing that gap around that 44 mark, it just seems to me like it's just a bit overdone here, a little bit of too much enthusiasm. I don't think it's going to change the numbers so dramatically but, for, for Charles Schwab. But let's add one thing here, Merlin. If we have this consolidation continue, and we probably will, sure. and competition is, is it going to be good for competition? Is it going to be bad for competition? What's going to be the net impact of service to the retail clientele? I personally think it's going to decline. You have a, a you have fewer to choose from, right? So you're going to be stuck with the practices of one or two big firms out there. And um, I, I I like when I have choices and I can go to where I want to go to get the best service, best uh, prices, best deals. And that's going to start to decline. Well, for the big ones, but there's always going to be some niche players that mm -hmm. will going to that are going to specialize. I know. I remember when I remember in the '60s and '70s when we had a big consolidation in the investment banking space. There was a bunch of little mom and pop ba investment banking firms out there that needed to get rolled up. Uh, Citibank did a bunch of those they, with Smith Barney and a bunch of others out there. But there was always a few firms that had specialty skills that could carve a niche for themselves. Uh, and I think, and we saw this with ECNs, you know, we saw this when we started to see the roll up of the broker dealers back in 2000. You know, what happened to Instanet and some right. of those firms. Island, Daytech. Island, Daytech, all those firms. Uh, TD Waterhouse, before it was TD Ameritrade, it was <laughs> called TD Waterhouse. So when all those get rolled up, you still have some specialty firms that are going to survive, that are going to carve out a niche for themselves. IBD, Trade Station. Yeah. Uh, Tasty Works, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have smaller broker dealers that are gonna be able to give a higher level of service for some niche clientele in a specialty area. Well, we'll see. Right now, I know that it's uh, it's certainly gonna have to pass through some regulators, as John said. That's a pretty big merger, and it ties it kind of brings together two major players in the industry. There's always that antitrust type of talk, so we'll see how that one pans out. Also with Goldman Sachs and E Trade. All in all, uh, I, I think it's not it's good to see consolidation in the industry. I don't think it's overly a bad thing until we get too consolidated, then we start to lose choice. Uh, let's take a quick break here. We come back. I get a couple things I want to talk about. One, as I see going on in the chat over here with Unscamble and Patrick and Ruben. The Tesla truck. Oh, yeah, that was a fun one today, or last night. So we'll, we'll talk about that briefly, then we can be entertained by all the comments and feedback going through social media. If you guys have questions for us, let us know what they are. Send them on in at powertradingradio.com by clicking Power Blast. Or, as you are right now, continue those discussions on our social media channels on YouTube, or which is going to be on Power Training Radio, as well as Online Training Academy's YouTube channel. We'll be right back after a short break. Learning this way is fine when the stakes are low. But when the stakes are high, you need to rely on skill, not just knowledge. 
At Online Trading Academy, you build your skill one step at a time. We teach our students to trade and invest with a strategy, not a hunch. You learn our methodology, then practice it. You get to make mistakes and ask questions, and watch instructors make live trades. Develop your skill the right way. Click here to get started with Online Trading Academy. Meet Mac. As a trader, he liked the signals that came from technical analysis tools, but they didn't help him find the best trades consistently, so he searched for a new approach. Mac attended Online Trading Academy's free class and discovered their core strategy, a trading methodology that spots when big banks are likely buying and selling, so everyday investors can too. Mac carved out a path to trade and invest with confidence, and so can you. You've been listening to Power Trading Radio, live, fueled by Online Trading Academy. To learn more, visit us online at powertradingradio.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio. It is your weekend edition. It's Friday. John O'Donnell is here in studio with us. We were talking, uh, answering some listener questions. Tom uh, Lichtenberger on Twitter sent in to Online Trading Academy talking about the different brokerage firms. I have a few people asking us about Tesla today, which uh, I have to say I found extremely entertaining yesterday. I know some of you probably watched the, the unveiling of the Cybertruck yesterday, which looks totally like something out of the Terminator. Uh, it's probably powered by Skynet, for all we know. Delo DeLorean-esque. It did, it did have a DeLorean-esque. Yeah, it's, it's actually for Back to the Future 72, which will be coming out in a few years. Um, it was, sad to say, a, a, a not a good showing. It was not well received, and of course, probably the highlight, and this is the unfortunate part, the highlight of the whole thing wasn't the release of the truck. It was the breaking of the bulletproof windows. And poor Elon Musk, I love his response. I can't say it here on the radio, but it was like, oh my bleeping God. <laughs> it was really darn funny. Um, Tesla on the day down 6%, so not that well received. John, um, I can tell you right now that truck is clearly not for me. I think it looked absolutely hideous. I didn't like it at all. I have coworkers who are raving about it. I know that Ruben right now is probably putting a $100 down payment because he's going to have that thing first and cruise it around LA. Am I going to catch you in that bad boy? Only if it's proven that you can pick up chicks. <laughs> at the <laughs> And that is such... Uh, Barbara, give me a call. We'll, uh... Uh, <laughs> that is so far out of my wheelhouse and capability. <laughs> nowadays at this chapter <laughs> of my life. I don't think we're going to have one. Also, I have a son that lives in Montana, and he told me immediately there is no way they're going to let one of those cross the state line into Montana. So I don't know. Who knows? I guess it's going to appeal to you know, a particular demographic. Uh, but I don't see the guy who, the plumber who comes over to fix my plumbing every once in a while, Pulling up in one of those, pulling his tools out of the back. I just, I just. Well, you know, it. if you're gonna make, if you're gonna put so much emphasis on one feature of your of your product, it sure as hell better work. And man, they made a, a big show out of this bulletproof glass dropping this giant steel ball higher up and higher up, and it's like a circus show. It's like, oh yeah, go higher in the ladder, drop the ball, and then that guy shatters the window not once but twice. twice. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know about you guys. I'm not so... I do live in Southern California wonder, where having what? bulletproof glass is probably a good thing, but who really cares? Like, I, I, want, I want fuel economy. Of course, you don't need fuel economy in your electric truck. Um, I thought stylistically it didn't look that great. Bottom line is, was not that well received today. Uh, again, down about 6%. So, okay. Merlin, you're not going to get one? No. No. Hey, look. It's only 40,000 stripped down. I mean, no, come no, on. No, no, I think it's 50. But anyway, I have a coworker who's like raving about it. Oh, you got to get one. You got to get one. I said, you know what I want from Tesla? I want that Roadster. That Roadster was one of the coolest things I've seen, and they, that's not even close to production. So this is a pipe dream. It's just there to get people all fired up. It looked cool. Whatever, I'm not too worried about it. Well, real bottom line is, our units going to sail? Is it going to have yeah. an impact on the shares over time? And or is this just going to cannibalize other production that they should be doing where they're really going to get some margin? I don't, I don't know. We'll see. I don't think Ford, it, with the... F-150 product line is shaking in their boots this morning. <laughs> no, and it's funny because a lot of people are talking about the speed, right? Zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. Um, that's what my plumber needs, they, absolutely. Yeah, I, that's what I want. When I'm, when I'm bringing my refrigerator <laughs> home in the back of my truck, that's I want, what I want I to need. be able to accelerate that quick and watch it fly into the people That's exactly me. what we need. <laughs> All right. We but hey, I don't have an internal combustion engine, but where's my refrigerator? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, what else you got in your uh, itinerary, John? Any any uh, any topics you want to bring up? I know you had a whole bunch of charts there earlier. 
Yeah. Well, why don't, why, don't we, why don't we pull up some of our charts? Let's take okay. a look. Some of those look kind of interesting. Uh, those might uh, all right, pique TG, a little interest in up there our, earlier, our right? little there's, audience. There's a ton here. of stuff going. I don't know where. We got charts all over the place. I got so many charts here. Let's take a look at this one. This one? Yeah, this what one do we got here? By the way, uh, we'll just give you a little preview. We did a uh, JO Chart of the Week series on this one On this today. one. Okay. Uh, cool. And I think it will appear next Tuesday, a little commentary over this. This is the 40-foot container rate. You know, the big containers that these ocean liners, uh, shipping uh, freighters use, has been dramatically fluctuating in price, Merlin. You can see that from the peak, it's gone from about $1,650 rent uh, down today to about $1,230. And this is a fantastic... It's a 25% uh, drop. And this is telling you that global trade is slowing. If, because there's really almost a fixed amount of these containers out there. It's that was my question. I was going to say, it's not I necessarily mean, it, that it's slowing. If the assumption would be that if the content, number of containers stay the same, or rel yes. Relatively okay, the same okay. to, the, to the demand. And, you know, it's a classic supply and demand situation. Sure. You have falling demand with a basically consistent supply. Or, you know, I mean, the number of containers, it's not like overnight you just snap your fingers and create more of these containers. And there's hundreds of thousands of these containers out there already. So basically, you, you kind of see that um, uh, global trade is slowing, and I think this is a byproduct of the, uh, of the whole shipping rates. This isn't just the rental rate for the container, but this is a, also a product of what is the shipping rate to ship a ton of hard goods across an ocean. And this is a byproduct of the trade tariffs, Merlin. They're, they're but isn't this, so I'm looking and, at this. And, and the global slowing economy. I, I mean, think it they're looks, connected. It looks bad, but could we not make the assessment that the because the cost has been dropping to ship those containers, that it's actually good for us because now the, the cost to ship goods is cheaper. That means those savings can maybe push on to other people. Maybe the, the tariffs... Uh, can be offset by the decline in the transportation and shipping costs. Well, the transportation costs are already pretty efficient. I mean, the nice thing about, uh, you know, the container uh, methodology that we have to move goods where you pick these things up with a gantry train and put them onto a flatbed rail car and ship them across the country, that's outrageously efficient already. This is just the rate to rent that particular container. If, if you have some goods you want to move from Shanghai to Long Beach, you know, you don't need to own these containers. You simply rent them for a particular right. trip. This is probably showing you that the number of containers getting shipped in a given moment of time is slowing down. It's a sign of, of slowing global trade. Mm -hmm. okay. But, you know, what's I was the just real... i devil's advocate here because... Yeah, but, know, but, but what's the real cost? The real cost are what are the inputs to make those goods? How much labor goes into it? You know, you got the cost of capital for the amount of time it takes to put it into production and ship it. Um, this also could, could, get, could get, get tied seasonally to agricultural production. You know, where are your bananas coming from? Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got a short window of time. You need to move those bananas from South America to wherever they're going, port of call. But I think, to me, it's a symptom of, and, and that's what this, that's here, the global economy is not booming. Uh, right now, we're we're it's slow in Europe. We had a guest on last week, I think it was, that we brought up some data about slowing GDP there. So that's where we are. Uh, let's see. I wanted to see if I could bring this one up. You mentioned this one. So this is something you've been talking about for quite some time, which is the Baltic Dry Index. Yeah. How does that tie into this? I mean, obviously, it's shipping, it's transport. Well, the Baltic Shipping Dry Index is the actual shipping rate. This is just the rental rate for one of those containers. So they tie together. And if, you're, if, you're, if the shipping rate is coming down, and that's what this chart is showing us, that means there's less demand to ship goods, uh, dry goods. And, and these are big commodities sure. that, that need to get shipped, okay? Um, that it's slowing in, uh, you but know, still, demand. But, you know, but, but I get it, I get it, but... Um, you know, it's, uh, this is why I wanted to look at that because that chart you had really only shows us the past mm, year or so. But, it, you know, going back to 2016, you know, the Baltic Dry Index was sub 500. Uh, it looked like it was down about 250. Uh, obviously, it had a huge spike up. But if I was to draw a line here, if I was a, a technical analysis guy, which I am, and put on, let's say, a 20-period moving average, 
we are probably right back at maybe just slightly below right now that 20 period moving average, right? If you look historically from 2000 and, and late 2014, uh -huh. we've had this slow tr move to the upside, some uh, large moves up. So to me, it, it doesn't seem like it's that bad. It's actually just kind of right back to its average. Well, I can show you, I, if we go back and look w more years than that, and I'll show you where you can get this chart. You can get it in pricethangold.com. Mm -hmm. There have been cases, Merlin, where that Baltic Dry Index was over 9,000. Wow. Okay. Okay. So on a relative basis going back more than five years, and remember, we've had a big bull market since March of 09. So to just to go back five years, we don't have enough data to put it in context. But I have seen that Baltic Dry Index at times sure. at over 9,000. Sure, sure. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, I think it's nice when we look at a, a piece of data to take a step back and look at maybe the bigger picture. I wish I had more data here. Unfortunately, Bloomberg only gives me five years on that Baltic Dry Index. So, And, and, and think about this. In, in a giant bull market we've had over the last five years, that's basically a sideways market. Yeah, right. So it's not like we're getting a great lift in growth. What's happened, we've probably had a multiple expansion. We've had PEs go from 15 to PEs to 19s. So it's not that the economies are operating that much more efficiently. You know, we have a low unemployment rate, but that doesn't take into consideration all the people that stop looking for a job. So that number's a little bit uh, calloused. Yep. Uh, but basically, it's kind of flat. And you know that Europe is weak. Europe has all kinds of problems, much bigger problems than we have. Gotta love Europe and their problems. Um, all right, I was gonna go take a break, but you know what, why bother? We'll just keep on rolling through. Uh, retailers have also been a topic of discussion. I wanna show you a couple retail charts here. So TJ, if you wouldn't mind, we got, we got stuff going on all over the place with regards to charts. So bring me back up, click. Uh, I wanna look at a couple of the reported earnings this week. We have TJX. Uh, here is your TJ Maxx chart. Of course, they reported earnings this week. It started off okay, um, giving back a little bit. You know, we're kind of where we, pretty much where we started the week for TJ Maxx. Uh, you have Target this week. I think you had Walmart. Was Walmart this week, TJ, or last week? I think it might have been this week. Um, here's Target, looking pretty good. Uh, this is one of the ones that actually helping that Dow. And, cool. and, and IYR. Uh, look at IYR. Hold on, that's real estate. I, wanna go, I don't want to go there yet. I want to go to Walmart. Walmart, I uh, thought they were last no, week. I, I'm sorry, IRT. Yes, one, one more I, second. I Let's go to Ross Stores, R-O-S-T. Uh, they reported just yesterday or today, uh, kind of a little bit, not that great. Let's go, there's three more that I want to look at. That's going to be Macy's reported. Oh, they're in tough shape. <laughs> yeah, Macy's is yeah. not. Macy's is probably the ugliest yeah. one of this group. Uh, the way of the glue factory. And let's look at GPS. Uh, that is get the Gap Stores. No, that's not Gap Stores. Take a look at I, uh, G -P -S. Uh, IRT. All right, IRT will be the next one we take a peek at. Uh, Gap Stores looks like flat store. Boy, they've really done nothing for the better part of this year, uh, at least since June. What did you want? I, I, what? IRT. IRT. All right, uh, this has been the topic of discussion and how real... Um, no, I, I'm sorry, IYR. Try IYR. Uh, no, that's not, what you're, that's not what you want. That's the real estate. That's not malls. You want malls, right? No, I want the retail um, ETF. All right, here's IYR. No, this is real estate. It looks like SPG, TJ. That's, that's a good one. Uh, this is another one. We talked about malls suffering. I think that's why Macy's is getting crushed so much. Macy's never really went into the online space. Uh, there's talks about a lot of, I forgot the name. There's one major investor. It wasn't uh, somebody, but you guys Macy's? online probably know. Well, one of the major uh, money guys is making big short bets on Simon Property Group and malls out there, really betting that they're going to be going down. And notice, uh, we've been talking about our bearishness on this for quite some time. That trend has not seemed to stop, right? It's, it's just getting weaker and weaker. It actually looks like it's a point where we could see a significant break in SPG to the south side. Uh, I, I saw the, the target earnings. That obviously was the best of the week for the companies I just looked at, which is TJ Maxx, Target, Ross, uh, Gap Stores, Macy's, and Buckle. Um, but it doesn't look that rosy for these smaller ones, no, John? No. You know, they're all being uh, greatly disrupted by Amazon. <laughs> and and if, rule if, the world. And if you haven't adapted a mobile or online strategy, you know, you're going to be the next Sears or the next uh, J.C. Penney's. I mean, you must adapt and be agile in this environment yeah. because the customer is king and that's how they want to get served. <sighs> All right. Uh, let's see. I had one other. There's a question that came through over here. Um, 
Augie sending a power blast. I, I got only one power blast today during the show. Seems kind of quiet out there for those of you that are using power blast. Uh, Augie says, special thanks to Luis Carr and support team for a wonderful week and professional Forex trader online. Yeah, unsung heroes out there, huh? It's kind of difficult. For me, it's kind of difficult as a teacher to teach that online class. It's kind of like doing this radio show, you know, or I say radio show, doing this show. Uh, I can tell from a few of you uh, that by your enthusiasm and the amount that you comment that you either like the show or the community, right? There's an aspect to it because you're, you're very interactive. But uh, the vast majority of people that watch these shows aren't really interacting. They're not sending in comments, not, sending, not being a part of it. That's the challenge with online classes. I taught a bunch of online classes, which I really enjoy. But I'm glad, Augie, that you sent in some nice feedback there. Uh, these instructors, especially Louise Carr, she just does it such a tremendous job and such a, a, a great trader and all, all in all nice person. You, do, you did a bunch of online stuff, didn't you? Yeah. And uh, the, the problem, the challenge, for the instructor is the only thing you get is chat feedback and, and yeah. you don't get that interpersonal. You can't see when their eyes glaze yeah, over and they don't and, get and something. You, you, don't, you don't know if they're snoring in the corner. You don't know if they're you know standing up and applauding. I used to get a lot of snoring in the corner. I got uh, to stand up and applauding. That's amazing. That you did? Yeah. I did. Oh, okay. Is that maybe that, that we get one. Okay. <laughs> That being said, all you get is a little bit of chat feedback, and you get a you get a you get a thumbs up at a boy every once in a while. But that's about that's tough. That's, yeah, that's tough. That's good. Uh, all right, weekend is upon us, John. Are you going to be doing anything fun this weekend? No, I'm going to be preparing uh, for my uh, upcoming Thanksgiving uh, holiday. That's basically what I'm going to do, and um, and I'm going to my Missouri Tigers this week are playing Tennessee, so I went you know, and I'm kind of looking forward to that. UCI got beat last night. Listen to this, Merlin. You'll like this. 22 seconds to go in the game. We're up by two points. We're at TCU on the road, which is 3-0. and uh, Expected to do well in the Big 12. And we're doing well. We had a great second half. Come back from a big deficit at halftime. Guess what happens? 22 seconds left. We're up two. Our guy goes to the free throw line. Misses a one-on-one. -on -one. They get the rebound. Go down and hit a three-point shot with three seconds to go to beat us. I, my heart, I did not sleep well Hold on last a second, night. I think I got some tissue around here somewhere. Merle, I, did, I did not sleep well last night. Oh, so I can tell, John, you're not yourself today. It's okay. I'm, 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 do, you, do you go to the games? I, like, some, I don't go to the games. Well, I, I live well, right here and I don't go to the, the games. You're in the neighborhood, they, they have excellent, you should go, it's a fantastic. Well, I know I, there's a lot of things I should do. I should be on vacation right now. That's what I should be doing, but. But my dedication to you guys, the fans, well, the on, viewers. But on vacation, you can still go to the game. You think I'm going to go on vacation in, in Irvine, California? Really? We live in large. All uh, right, let's go away from my vacation you know, schedule out there. Carl's, um, Carlsbad's fun. Carlsbad, Carlsbad's fun. No, I'm getting out of here. I'll let you guys know about my you vacation take schedule. New, I'm, take your new Tesla truck down there with you. December will be my vacation on, month. On, so. on one charge. Nope. Round not tripper. No, you're not going to see me in that thing. Jeez. You know what we ought to do? We ought to go rent one. Let's go rent one. And, yeah, and and that thing won't be out until 2023. Let's go, let's go rent one and, and pull up okay. in a, to conference. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wait on that one. Um, all right, next week's going to be a bit of an interesting week. As you guys know, Thursday and Friday, we've got Thanksgiving week upon us. Uh, those will both be for sure closed here for all my Trading Academy, Empire Trading Radio will be gone. Uh, still debating whether we're going to be doing shows Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'd hate to leave you guys hanging for an entire week, so I may just I come on and do some shows. How will our audience? They'll have withdrawals. <laughs> Hopefully, you guys won't have withdrawals. But no, uh, no, if you want me but to, but Merlin, no Merlin for five days. That's like, that's like uh, opiate. Uh, withdrawal. Isn't They're going to just be sitting in the corner shaking. Uh, let me go to our economic calendar for Monday so you guys can get an idea of what we're talking about. For the U.S., it's actually uh, Monday and Tuesday are kind of quiet. Wednesday really picks up with regards to announcements, but I'll leave you hanging on that one. Uh, for Monday, you see here the 25th, we have nothing for the U.S. We have German IFO business climate going on. For the British pound, you have CBI realized sales. Canada is looking at wholesale sales, retail sales for New Zealand. And finally, for Japan, we've got the BOJ business, or Bank of Japan core CPI numbers. Moving on to your earnings calendar. Again, it's a quiet week, although there's some big names on Monday. Palo Alto Networks, Agilent Technologies, Hewlett Packard, Jacobs Engineering, PVH Corp, and Nutanix will be reporting earnings on Monday. Hopefully, there's some... Uh, some fun and exciting thing happening with those earnings announcements. That, again, is just the cherry picking of the big names. There are more companies out there that have less than a billion dollar market cap, but we kind of cut, did the cutoff at one billion. I have to ask you this, because uh -oh. I know you're heavily engaged in it. What happened to crypto this week? What's going on in the crypto space? Uh, 
uh, you know, just falling out of favor a little bit. It'll, it'll, get, its, it'll get its comeuppance. Uh, okay. Uh, there were some very interesting things going on. It's funny because I have a bunch of different accounts out there, and Poloniex is actually one of the accounts I, I had a, a large amount at. And since Circle, who's backed by Goldman Sachs, remember, you remember Circle bought Poloniex? Yeah, that? yeah, I remember that. And I was thinking, wow, what a brilliant move by Goldman Sachs. So you own Circle, Circle buys Poloniex, and now you could, if you wanted to, create your own card, call it the Goldman Sachs card, since that's the thing everybody seems to be doing. You got the Tesla card, got the Apple card, got this card, that card. Start the Goldman Sachs card, which is basically a credit card, but you can now, through an app, say, oh, I want to use, I want to use my uh, Litecoin for this one. And they would use that exchange and basically facilitate trading there so you could have a full crypto exchange, back end it with a credit card, and allow people to do that. And I thought that's a brilliant idea. The crazy part is it looks like they're scuttling, almost like when uh, Schwab bought CyberTrader back in, the, in early 2000. They, they use it for a little bit, but they really scuttled the advanced version and left a basic version up there, which is Street Smart Pro. Um, it, it seems like Poloniex is just going to disappear, which is very, yeah, very bizarre. Well. well is that gonna? Is that gonna? Is, has that been part of the bearishness of the whole crypto space? Is the, uh, not that. I think that it, you have a, a wave of selling going on. Is there on something right now. else going on? I mean, it's come on, Marla. Sure, there's always going to be negative talk about it, and I think China is is a is a factor in it. They're talking about China selling a lot of cryptocurrencies right now, and who knows? One major statement could cause a big sway. I think what it is, it goes back to kind of supply and demand at just certain levels, because we were looking at that eight thousand mark on Bitcoin for quite some time as being this floor that was established and. Um, as we broke it, you guys heard me say, well, you now, now kind of all bets are off. Where is it going to go? You know, it could easily hit 6,000 and without any sweat, and then it'll have to establish another base, get a little comfort underneath it, because what happens is a lot of people start to do this panic sell thing, right? There isn't a real strategy. They're just kind of freaking out and selling, which causes further, more exaggerated moves. So uh, I think it's to the south side and negative until it finds a base somewhere and starts to stabilize. Okay. There you go. All right. Uh, last little crypto... Uh, annotation at the end of the show. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show with John O'Donnell and myself. If you have any questions, feel free to send them on in at powertradingradio.com. If you'd like to know more about Online Trading Academy and how we can help change your financial future, I would encourage you to click that link that's showing up in social media that I've only plugged one time in 41 minutes, but you can simply click that one, type in your zip code that'll tell you which of our 50 physical brick and mortar schools are nearest you. Each one has free classes, paid classes, community events, and much, much more. You might even get to meet some of the instructors there. Uh, oftentimes, they'll let you sit in the class for a minute just to see what it's all about and see how these assets Asset classes such as futures, forex, commodities uh, can potentially help uh, help you achieve that rate of return that you're looking to achieve. That will do it for us, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the show. On behalf of John Donald and myself, take care, everybody. We'll see you. Peace. We're out of here.